So, uh, we will go ahead and begin. We're in Lesson 11, and hope to finish that up tonight, and then go into Lesson 12. And I had mentioned that I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on Lesson 12, which is the ape-man question, the, the origin of man, did, did we descend from apes? I do want to touch on it some, because uh, I think it's important. So we'll look at that, and then we jump back to Lesson 10. So we'll remember that. We'll go back to Lesson 10, which is punctuated equilibria. The hopeful monsters. Okay. And then Lessons 4 and 5. And then we go into um, the uh, ultimate proof of creation. We, we are going over so much evidence against evolution and for creation. This book is full of the evidence, and this is only a tiny little snippet of the evidence. I've got several books here uh, from my collection of many more than this, over 20 books that I have on uh, creation and evolution that give evidence for creation and against evolution. So, with all that evidence, why don't evolutionists give up their theories, give up their ideas, give up their naysaying, and come over to the creation side? I think our, the evidence for creation is far superior. And uh, a logical examination of the evidence would cause someone to clearly uh, lean toward the side or go toward the side of creation. So why don't they do it? Well, they don't do it for one reason. And I'm going to introduce you to a word that you may or may not know. But we're going to spend some time on this as we go forward. It's because of that word right there, worldview. In other words, the evidence is not convincing them because of their worldview. Okay, when we get into the ultimate proof of creation, we're going to be talking about worldview in uh, some detail. And you'll get a better understanding why we can't just throw evidence at each other hoping to convince each other. Now, if evidence is important to let them see that there's more to creation than just some mystical being out there in the, in the sky. You know, they, they don't understand God. Of course, they don't understand the Bible. So they have created in their own minds some um, caricature of God. So it's good to give them evidence, to show them that we do have evidence on our side, and we've got a lot of evidence on our side. But then, when that doesn't convince them, then you've got to go after their worldview. Show them that their worldview does not make sense, and that the creation worldview is um, much more logical and reasonable. Okay, we are... Talking about uh, catastrophism, uh, particularly the, the flood, we had talked about creation as part of catastrophism because of all of the turmoil that happened on the earth when God created the world and caused the seas, caused the dry land to appear and the seas to be created. That caused a tremendous upheaval in the crust of the earth. But the flood, caused what, uh, what we see, most of what we can see, the evidence uh, in the Earth's crust, which is the sedimentary rock. I believe, as I said before, this, that is, the sedimentary rock is evidence of the flood, the worldwide Noahic flood uh, that's recorded in the Bible. All right, but I want to talk about one aspect of that, the sedimentary rock, and that is this. There is little to no, virtually no, evidence of vegetation between 
the many, 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 many layers of sedimentary rock. How can that be when it took millions of years to lay each layer? There's no evidence of trees. There's no evidence of grass or roots. You know, roots that dig down into the layers below. Where's all the evidence of that? There is a word that may be new to you called bioturbation. And that just means that's uh, combining the words biology and disturb. So biological disturbing of the Earth's surface. So it's not just the plants, it's also animals burrowing. And many animals burrow and, and dig uh, sometimes pretty big and deep burrows in the earth. Where is evidence of that? It doesn't exist. Why is that? Because they weren't laid down over long periods of time. The evidence is that it was all laid down at the same time in a worldwide flood. So, when somebody's talking to you about um, evolution and, and think they've got the answers, here's one simple question to ask them. Where's the vegetation between the layers of sedimentary rock? You don't have to remember the word bioturbation. Just say, where are the, where's the evidence of vegetation or even animal activity between all the layers, the many, many, many layers that took supposedly millions of years to lay down? That'll be a tough question for him to answer. Grand Canyon is a wonderful uh, picture that we can look at and see uh, the flood or the results of the flood. We have many layers of sediment laid down over so-called millions of years. If that were true, it would have taken many floods all over the earth. Think about that. We say, and the Bible says, that there is one flood all over the world. In order for evolution to be true, and uniformitarianism to be true, as opposed to catastrophism, there would have to be many floods, not many worldwide floods, but many local floods that cover, what we say, 70%, that sedimentary rock covers up to 70% of the world's surface that there would have to be floods all over the world and many of them to lay down this many layers. That would be a tough thing to try to defend. Grand Canyon, when you, when you measure how much earth used to be there, that is 900 million cubic miles of sediment that doesn't exist there anymore. All of this area here that used to have soil in it, 900 million cubic miles, think about that, just in Grand Canyon. Where is it? If it were actually laid down by one river, or, or I'm sorry, if the Grand Canyon were cut out by one river, where is all that sediment that it carried away? It would have had to go downstream and be laid down, downstream. It's not there. Where is it? I think it makes much more sense to believe that it was all washed away during a big, huge, worldwide flood. And it was all washed away while the, all of this was still wet and moist, before it became rock. So all these layers, you know, when the, when the Earth was covered with water, violent water, very turbid water, was agitating all of those, uh, all that silt and dirt and sand, and it was laying it down a little at a time, layer by layer by layer by layer. And then it washed the rest away to, you know, way on downstream. It didn't have to be cut, carried by just one small river. Another picture of Grand Canyon, just seeing the massive size of Grand Canyon and all of the earth that doesn't exist anymore was washed away. Okay. Um,
we talked a little bit about fossilization, and we, we mentioned that most animals, when they die, they just die, and by weather and scavengers, they, uh, their remains are destroyed, and they don't exist. You, you can't find them a few years later. They are not buried and become fossilized. So how does fossilization happen? It has to be hard parts. Very rarely do the soft uh, parts of a, an animal become fossilized. It's usually bone, teeth, and, and shells. But they must be protected from de decay. So they must be buried rapidly. They must be protected from uh, scavengers and from the weather. So the best uh, conditions for that to happen is a rapid burial which, of course, is answered by the worldwide flood. Notice, this is, this is interesting. I want you all to think about this. The Bible was not written, the, the account of the, of the flood was not written in order to try to answer the evidence that we find of the fossils and the sedimentary rock all over the world. The Bible was written long before anybody discovered any of that. We find the evidence today, and then we can look at the Bible, which was written 3,000 years before the account of the flood, and we say, oh, God knew what happened. That explains what I see in the evidence. Biologists and evolutionists today, they rewrite they write the, their theories as they go, and when they find something that doesn't agree with their theories, they change their theories. They rewrite their, their ideas. We, we've quoted, quoted many, many people saying, well, we've got problems with this. We don't quite understand this. We're having to change our theory on this. Why? I thought they had all the answers. I thought scientists and evolutionists had all the answers. They don't. They're having to rewrite it as they go and find more evidence. And when we call them on their theories and show them how that their theories do not match up with the evidence, they have to come up with plan B, plan C, plan X, Y, Z, and, uh, and so on. I believe when you look at fossils, and when you look at even sedimentary rock, you're seeing, okay, evolutionists think of fossils as being just a, a moving picture of Earth's history over the millions of years of animal life on the earth. But I don't think that's true. I think that is a, not a moving picture, not a movie, but a snapshot, just of one year of what went on on the earth, just in one year. And I, I believe that fits the evidence. Well, here's another thing we mentioned briefly. I didn't talk about it much, and that is fossil graveyard. That is large, accumulations of fossils in a small area and they're found all over the world millions of animals that are mangled and twisted and thrown together in one place and then rapidly buried and they become fossilized any idea how that might have happened maybe something that was written 3,000 years before anybody discovered <laughs> a uh, fossil graveyard here are some pictures of fossil graveyards. These are just hundreds, thousands, and even millions of animal remains that are just cast wildly, mangled and twisted into one small area, rapidly buried, and become fossilized. This is dinosaurs, dinosaur fossils. It's not just marine organisms. These are just tons of fossils of, of dinosaurs that are just cast together. This is Dinosaur Monument, where you can go today and dig, and just there's tons of dinosaur fossils that are just thrown together wildly and mangled and twisted. Here are some marine fossils that are just thrown together. More bones just thrown together. These exist all over the world. It's hard to explain them away if you're a uniformitarian much more easily explained by the Bible. Here's another thing that's more, 
This is a pretty cool fossil. This one's uh, a fossil of a fish eating a fish. What does that tell you? It died and was buried rapidly. Both of them died and were buried rapidly and fossilized. That's the only explanation for that. What about this one? This one's really cool. This is a swimming rep reptile. It's not a fish, it's not a mammal, it's a, actually a swimming reptile. And what is she doing? She is giving birth to her baby. Boom, rapidly buried and fossilized in motion. No other explanation for that than the flood. All right, another thing. This one is covered in, in the book. If you read this lesson, uh, you might have run across the mention of Dr. Mary Schweitzer, who has discovered something. She has discovered dinosaur fossils that have soft tissue in them. Soft, fibrous, and flexible tissue. Here are some pictures of it. This is the soft, you can touch it and feel it, and it's, it's, a, it's just, it gives. But fossils are hard as rock, right? Why are something that's supposed to be millions of years old, hundreds of millions of years old, why can it be soft? They say that's not possible. It would have fossilized long, long ago. So Dr. Mary Schweitzer says, blood cells in a dinosaur bone should have disappeared eons ago. I got goosebumps. She was the one who discovered this. She said, I got goosebumps. It was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone. The bones are after all, 65 million years old. How could blood cells survive that long? She still believes they're 65 million years old, but she's, she's having to shake her head saying, well, here's what the evidence is. How would that be possible? That was an article she wrote in 1993. Then in some personal uh, communication, she said, our current theories do not account for soft tissues. In other words, the theories that we've written about evolution that we've come up with, they don't explain this. They cannot account for soft tissues and cellular preservation. Never in my wildest dreams would I have predicted what we found. Why not? Why don't you just not predict, just go find? That's what a scientist is supposed to do. You're supposed to investigate, experiment, go to the lab, go to the field dig and find and just let the evidence lead you to this conclusion. But it sounds like you've got a theory that you're trying to support. Never in my wildest dream would I have predicted what we found. Then she said the next year, I had one reviewer tell me, this is Mary Schweitzer talking, I had one reviewer tell me that he didn't care what the data said. He knew what I was finding wasn't possible. And that's the end of that. So Mary Schweitzer wrote back and said, what data would convince you? He said, none. There's a scientist for you. Scientist has his theory. Scientist has his worldview. Evidence does nothing. Evidence found by a fellow evolutionist does nothing to persuade him otherwise. That's impossible, can't be done. She has written over 30 peer-reviewed scientific articles or in publications, over 30 publications. So she is a credentialed evolutionist, credentialed scientist. But the evidence, they said, nope, not going to believe it, can't believe it. End of story. They're, they are not scientists. They are people who are trying to support a theory. Signed, uh, soft tissue dinos dinosaur fossils. Here are some quotes that I found on that. Today, paleontologists are still stunned to see the stuff in so many different specimens. 
It's not just a fluke occurrence more pervasive in the fossil record. These are 70 million year old, miraculously, nice word there, miraculously preserved soft tissue. How about 4,500 year old fossils? That would explain it, wouldn't it? Fits the evidence better, doesn't it? But there's one, another quote, a growing number of sample tissues of this soft tissue. It's the freshest dinosaur bone. Dinosaur shocker. The reason it hasn't been discovered before is that no right-thinking paleontologist would do what Mary did with her specimen. She had to boil them and try to find them in a different way than they normally would look at fossils. But no right-thinking paleontologists would do what she did. That's why we never found them before. She wasn't right thinking. She didn't follow the right worldview. Features that defy evolution. Yes. Yes. You're going to miss the creatures that defy evolution? All right. Y'all know the drill. We're just talking about some creatures that cannot be explained by evolutionary theory. They defy evolutionary explanations. So, and I had mentioned before that we were going to look at this one. We're talking about migratory instincts. Many types of animals migrate. Y'all know what migration is, where they travel long distances. Uh, bats will, will travel for three months in one long, one-way trip. Whales, gray whales migrate 10,000 miles. And they, they do it at a certain time of year, and they know exactly where they're going. Birds migrate. You all have heard of birds flying south for the winter. Many birds migrate. But the Arctic tern migrates 14,000 miles one way. Talking about migratory instincts and our creatures that defy evolution. Fish, salmon, they migrate long distances. Eels, also in the sea. Turtles, talking about aquatic turtles. Uh, migrate long distances. Seals migrate. And also butterflies migrate long distances. So, what categories of animals do we have here that have these migratory instincts and migra migrate many miles? Well, we have flying mammals, the bats. We have aquatic mammals, whales. We have birds, many different birds. We have fish, that is the many fish like the salmon and, and eels also. We have aquatic reptiles like the uh, turtles, sea turtles. And we have insects. Look at all of the many varieties of kinds of animals that migrate, that have these migratory instincts. Well, we're going to talk about one of them, that is the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly migrates up to 3,000 miles. All right, y'all get this. But it's not one butterfly that migrates that far. This defies evolutionary explanation. This is a four-stage process executed by four generations of butterflies. All right, in March, you have, let's say, the overwinter butterflies. Generation four from the previous year, I'll explain that in a minute, they are, or they are living down here. You'll see that in a minute. Okay, they're living far south. All right, in March, their hibernation ends. 
either overwintering end in Mexico or California, and they begin migrating north. All right, they start coming north. Some of them go this way, some go this way. And then they lay eggs in the southern U.S. All right, remember they hibernated here, they woke up, and then they start heading north, and then they lay eggs along the way. That is generation one. Generation one hatches and begin their migration northward. And that last generation starts to die away. The one from the previous year that laid those eggs, they die away. So generation one is starting to move northward. They lay eggs and they hatch and they move northward. That's generation two. They do the same process and they you go even further, farther north. All right, they repeat, generation three repeats the process and they end up way north in the northern U.S. and Canada for the summer. And so they lay eggs. Generation four, and what does generation four do? They fly south. They migrate up to 3,000 miles. And they spend the winter in the same woods, often in the very same trees, that their great-grandparents overwintered in the previous year. Y'all got that picture? Generation four lays eggs up here. They lay eggs up here. They lay eggs up here. We got generation four up here. Have they ever seen those woods? No. They hatch, they fly south to the very same spot, sometimes in the very same trees that their great great grandparents uh, migrated or, and, um, and lived in, and hibernated in. This defies evolutionary explanation. Up to, I mean, millions of butterflies kind of a blurry picture, but that's just millions of butterflies in these trees. Look at this. If we can get this to work. Those woods are just filled with millions and millions and millions of butterflies. All these are monarch butterflies down there in Mexico, California. That area, millions of them. The woods are just covered with them. The trees are just covered with them. And they came from 3,000 miles away to that one spot. And they'd never seen it before, never been there. Maybe they heard their great great grandparents tell them, here's where you go, here's where we hibernated that year. They have no explanation for it. You look up um, their explanation for migratory instincts of uh, monarch butterflies and they'll say amazingly some researchers think what do you mean? Don't you know? You're a scientist. This is an area of great interest for researchers. I suppose it is. Another quote, there are many unanswered questions about how these small organisms are able to travel so far. Another unsolved mystery is how the monarchs find the overwintering sites each year. Somehow, they know their way. Even though the butterflies returning to Mexico or California are the great, great grandchildren of the butterflies that left the previous spring. Somehow they know their way. No one knows exactly how their homing system works. It is another of the many unanswered questions. Evolution has no explanation for monarch butterfly 
migratory instincts and migratory behavior. But the Bible does. In Job 12, God said, But now ask the beasts, and they will tell you. And the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you. And the fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beasts of the earth, each according to his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Just another of the many creatures that defy evolutionary explanation. I just love to think about these, study them, talk about them. And I uh, appreciate you bearing with me as we go through these because I think it's so exciting and it should affirm your faith that God did create just like he said he did. We talked about polystrate trees. Y'all think about, y'all, I want y'all to know that word. Poly, straight. Poly meaning many. Straight meaning strata or layer. A tree that transverses many layers of sedimentary rock that supposed, supposedly took millions of years to lay down. And they exist all over the world. Not surprisingly. So what we would expect, our, our predictions are, I mean, uh, from uh, creation uh, theory, if you will, certain predictions are made. Here's what we should expect to find. We go out and we find that very thing. Uniform, uniformitarianism cannot explain these facts. Catastrophism, the flood, does explain the facts. And once again, it was written 3,000 years before anybody ever discovered all of this evidence that they are scrambling to try to explain with their theories. Much better explained in terms of catastrophism. And it's best explained in terms of one worldwide flood as opposed to... Now there are some people who believe in catastrophism, but they believe in many local floods. But they have a, a tough time explaining that, how the high mountains could be covered by a worldwide flood, by a flood, and um, marine mammals and marine fossils be found on, t on the top of mountains. This is best explained in terms of a worldwide flood. Fossils are a snapshot of the earth uh, at, in Noah's day. So some of these animals, and in fact, I would say practically all the animals you find uh, fossilized, they were alive when Noah was alive. Noah might have actually seen some of them. Flood theory, this is what I've been saying, flood theory was not invented to explain the evidence as it exists. God revealed it to us 3,000 years before the evidence was even found. Geolog geological and fossil evidence fits perfectly with, with God's revelation. There is evidence for a young earth. We talked about un unfossilized soft tissue of dinosaur, blood and bones. How? If they are 70 million years old plus. Ocean concentrations, that is, the silt in the oceans that is being accumulated at a certain rate every year, that silt gets a certain amount deeper every year. If that's true, it should have been miles thick, but it's only feet thick. So they are much too young to be explained by um, 
uniformitarianism. The Mississippi Delta, the same thing. There should, should, there should not be a Gulf of Mexico because the silt that is being accumulated in the, in the Gulf of Mexico by the Mississippi River is, is accumulating much too fast. If, it, if that happened over millions of years, like they say, it would have accumulated so much that there wouldn't even be water there. There wouldn't be a Gulf of Mexico. This is evidence for a young earth. Recorded history. Why is recorded history only about 5,000 years old? If man existed for thousands of years before that, hundreds of thousands of years before that, why isn't there any evidence of intelligent man before 5,000 years ago? Can't be explained by evolutionary theory. Earth's rotation, Earth's spin is slowing down every year. If that's true and if that were happening for millions of years, we'd be, we'd be uh, toast, we'd be fried, or we'd be freezing to death because the Earth would have slowed to just about a stop by now. Can't be explained by evolutionary theory. Niagara Falls, it erodes by about three and a half feet every year. That is, it knocks away, if you ever go to Niagara Falls, you see these large rocks down there at the bottom of the falls. It's because it's eroding by all that, that water that is constantly flowing over the falls and loosening that rock a little at a time to the point of three and a half feet every year. If that were true, for millions of years, it would have been gone long ago. Cosmic dust, there is dust that's falling down from space on the earth all the time. It can be measured. It's, uh, it's evident all over the world. But there's far too little of it for it to have been happening for millions of years. Earth's magnetic field is getting weaker all the time. It gets half as strong after every 1,400 years. 1,400 years, the Earth's magnetic field gets weaker. It's, it, it gets cut in half. Then another 1,400 years later, it's down to one-fourth of its original. Then another 1,400 years, it's down to one-eighth. So it continues getting weaker and weaker. If that were true over millions of years, there would be no magnetic field on the Earth. There are many evidences for a young Earth. These are just a few, just a very few of the many evidences. There's several uh, listed in the book, and there are just more that we could, we could go over. Some of them are, take a little bit more explanation and harder to understand, but these are pretty easy to understand, and they have no answer for it. We're talking about things that defy evolutionary explanation. All right, with that, we end with uh, chapter 11, talking about the, the flood and um, fossils and the age of the earth. So, just wanted to briefly touch on chapter 12, lesson 12. What story do human fossils tell? Well, first of all, when you listen to evolutionary paleontologists, you should know that they start with the assumption that humans evolved. Why? Worldview. They have the worldview that evolution happened. Now, let's go find the evidence to back up what I already know is true. In other words, you think a scientist would go find the evidence and say, hmm, what does that tell us? No, we're trying to go, why do you think they're going to space? Why do we go to the moon? Why are we planning to go to Mars? Why don't we go explore space? To find out what's out there? Nope, 
to try to find evidence of life out in space. They're trying to find evidence that we're not the only ones in, in the universe. They have a theory to support. And they're going to try to find evidence for what they already know is true. But they, they have this assumption that, that we evolved and they automatically reject God and His Word. And this knowledge, as I said, came before any evidence was found. They're going and digging for the evidence to support their theory. So naturally the evidence is going to be made somehow, even if they have to cram it in there to fit the narrative, to fit their view, to fit their theory. Think about this, any series of objects created by humans or created by God could be lined up in such a way to make it look as they had evolved when in fact they were created independently by an intelligent being. That's a quote from this book, Bones of Contention by Marvin Rubenow. He is a creationist who is explaining human fossils. Any series of objects, let's, let's say from a, a wagon to a car, to a Cadillac, to a, the nicest car you can think of. You can, you can take a wagon, then you can take a Model A or Model T and Model A, and then, then you come into the 20s and 30s and 40s cars, and you get more and more complicated and more and more uh, sophisticated and bigger and faster and better and stronger and smarter cars. You could line those up in a way that supports evolution. But you know that didn't happen. They had an intelligent designer. They might say something like, if I hadn't believed it, I wouldn't have seen it. Y'all heard it the other way. If I hadn't seen it, I wouldn't believe it. Well, they say it the other way. No, I, if I hadn't believed it, my eyes wouldn't have seen what I told them to see. And Lubinow says, human evolution is a philosophical more than a scientific concept. Australopithecus afarensis, or Lucy, you've heard of Lucy, the, our supposed ancestor. It's really just a, an ape with the morphological characteristics of a knuckle walker. It's not a, not a bipedal um, human or half human. It's just an ape. They think it, they thought, or at least thought it used to uh, be an ancestor of modern man. But new fossils, not surprisingly, have thrown this scenario into doubt. So when they find more evidence, they quietly put their old theories aside. You know, when they, when they discover something that they say proves evolution, boom, it makes all the papers, it makes all the, the news. But then when they find out it's not true, they kind of sweep it away, quietly. Lubinow says, certainly in the evolutionary fossil record is now being replaced with question mark, excuse me, certainty in the evolutionary fossil record is now being replaced with question marks. Whereas they were certain, now they're starting to question themselves. The diversity of the human fossil record is now so similar to the bush-like record of other mammals that further evidence of a direct line of fo fossil evidence is deemed unnecessary. We don't need it. It doesn't, it doesn't look like a tree. The evolutionary uh, line from apes to man doesn't look like a tree, it looks like a bush. It's just jumbled up. So they say, ah, we don't need the evidence. We don't need a direct line of evidence. They say evolutionary history of humans is complex and unresolved. So I do want to 
um, talk a little bit more about this chapter. Um, there are some interesting facts about it. You know, this is this is one of the things, the chapters in this book that is, to me, I don't know. It's just we're trying to dispel their theories. You know, and it's not as um, exciting maybe as, as some of the rest of it. But there is there are some things that we would like to look at in more detail. So if you haven't um, if you haven't looked at lesson twelve, go ahead and do that one. Um, and but we will jump in back to lesson ten. Remember that lesson ten is next. Okay, there's our bell.